Welcome to the Complete Story series, where I take trade paperbacks and single issues and I break them down into digestible bites to help you understand. Then I read them dramatically back to you. All alterations to the panel's text and images are to prevent copyright problems, and all art is owned by its respective companies. Guys, we do this so that you can see what is going on in your favorite comic books right now, and you can then go out and buy the next issues. That's the entire purpose of this. And today we're going to be bringing you the Spider Geddon prequel. Now, the way this works is we're going to learn about three different spider people in the spider verse and how they become involved in the current events. And today's individuals are Spider Punk and Punk Hulk. We are then going to bring you Penny Parker from the Spider-Verse movie, but we're going to learn about the venom of her universe. And then we're going to tell you a little tale of Uncle Ben and Petey. I hope you guys enjoy. It's Earth-138. The streets in New York are quiet, well, sort of. The big man is thrown into the alleyway, clad in biker clothes, slamming into the ground, and his attacker follows up closely behind. I got two rules, Thunderstrike! And from the shadow steps Spider-Man. Jean vest, baseball bat, and metal spikes coming out of his head. This is Spider-Punk, the anarchist of the Spider-Verse. Spider-Punk doesn't like gods or monsters. The massive man on the ground fits both those descriptions. Thunderstrike tries to struggle to his feet, but gets a swift kick from Spider-Punk's high tops. Leaning in, Spider-Punk informs Thunderstrike, You better leave, but your hammer is staying here, or we're gonna have a little Ragnarok and roll. Before he could say a word, a blast of energy snaps out, hitting Thunderstrike. Light fills the alleyway, and where he once lay is only a pile of ash. Spider-Punk backs away, looking over his shoulder. That also sends a message, he quips, before him floats a strange being in a purple suit. Energy crackling out of his hands. It is Kang, the Conglomator. Raising his bat, Spider-Punk prepares for battle, yet Kang is not who he thinks he is. Spider-Punk simply stares, so Kang tells him his future. In the year 2099, Kangco owns all likeness rights to Spider-Punk's image, and with this, he makes millions in merchandising. Everything but the comics. The comics don't really sell that well. Realizing that he has become a sellout in the future, and it isn't even his fault, Spider-Punk becomes enraged. You're a dead man! He screams. Yet Kang pays him no attention and continues his monologue. He intends to take Spider-Punk back with him to the future. While pictures and movies are great, the real thing would make him billions. And Spider-Punk glares. You and what army? And as if on cue, more strange lights begin to fill the alleyway and Kang is surrounded by Spider-Punk looking egg things. The short-armed, egg-bodied Spider-Punks leap at our hero, who starts swinging his bat for all that he's worth. There are too many though, and he's quickly overwhelmed by the strange creatures. Kang begins to laugh. This is why people love Spider-Punk. The struggle, the fighting against overwhelming odds. And suddenly, the creatures go flying and Spider-Punk emerges, his costume torn and one eye exposed. He thwips away, reaching for his cell phone as the creature begins to give chase. He's gonna need backup. Across the city, Captain Anarchist is fighting the Annihilation Wave for putting on a surf concert in Harlem. Something about those bugs and surf music, I, I don't know. Spider-Punk is on his way and he needs the tape. Captain Anarchist is shocked. The tape? And Spider-Punk needs the atom bomb. Dropping next to his friend, Spider-Punk prepares to fight alongside Captain Anarchist. But they don't have to. Right behind him are the strange egg creatures, who immediately start fighting with the Annihilation Wave bugs. With their moment of rest, Captain Anarchist hands the tape over to Spider-Punk, but is knocked away by one of the creatures as they're thrown into him. Spider-Punk reacts quickly with his webbing shooting out to stop it, but not before it's down the throat of one of the bugs from the Annihilation Wave. Jumping to the creature, Spider-Punk pries it out of his mouth like he's a dog. Finally getting the tape, Spider-Punk and Captain Anarchist are greeted by the arrival of Kang. Spider-Punk warns Anarchist about Kang, but the future businessman looks at Anarchist with contempt. He has no need for Captain Anarchist. The man isn't profitable in the future. No one cares about him. And with that insult, Captain Anarchist leaps to attack Kang, hoping to give Spider-Punk some time as he thwips away. Racing through the city on his web line, Spidey finally arrives on a rooftop, and sitting there is his mohawked friend, Robbie. Spidey's gonna need Robbie, who angrily knocks away the tape that Spider-Punk is holding out. He's out, and he's not helping anymore. Kang arrives in the street below, and breaking away from his glaring argument with Robbie, Spider-Punk leaps down to meet him. He can't beat Kang, but he's not going down without a fight. The two begin their epic battle, and on the rooftop, Robbie watches before finally putting the tape into his Walkman. The music fills his ears. His eyes begin to flash green. The roar fills the night air as a massive figure leaps off the building, its fist coming straight down with gigantic force onto Kang's body. Spider-Punk cheers as Punk Hulk and Kang begin to fight it out. Kang's energy blasts begin to bounce off the Hulk's body, having little effect. 
Hulk grabs Kang, swinging him around, his body battering into the walls and street around them. Finally broken and defeated, Kang lays there. Spider-Punk ass, standing over his defeated enemy with a now slightly calmer Hulk. Why me? Why not Captain Anarchist? In the future, Anarchist died an old man that no one paid attention to anymore. But Spider-Punk, you died young, like every great bankable star. And with those final ominous words, Kang disappeared. Glaring at the spot where he once was, Spider-Punk finally turns to his green friend, but the two don't get to celebrate long as new energy fills the streets. Before them, a blue portal opens up and through its steps, Mayday Parker, Spider-Woman. Something big is happening in the multiverse. Something that needs them all together again. Spider-Punk hesitates for a moment and then steps through into the spider geddon Earth, 14512. Class has just ended. The teacher is making sure that the students remember their homework for the weekend. Happy to finally be finished for the day, Penny Parker is trying to get her things together. She's interrupted, however, by a new student who tries to introduce herself, Addie Brock. The white-haired girl extends her hand. Penny doesn't shake it, and she lets the girl know that if she wants to be cool, she shouldn't be seen talking to Penny. What Addie really wants, though, is to know if the rumors are true. Is Penny the pilot of the spider suit, the protector of the city? Penny doesn't want to talk about that and runs out of class. But the new girl, Addie, follows her, seemingly angered by Penny's refusal to talk. You think that you're so special, but you're not. Penny finally gets away, hearing one last yell from over her shoulder. Everyone is afraid to tell you what they really think because your father died. And with those parting words, Penny is gone. Back in the Parker residence, Penny walks in on her aunt and uncle discussing something called the Sim Engine, and the UN wanted to test it out. When questioned about it, Aunt May and Uncle Ben changed the subject, quickly asking about how her day was. Am I special? She asks. Her aunt and uncle reassure her that she is special. That's why she can pilot the spider suit, yet she's just one part of the team. And they're doing everything that they can to make sure that she's not out there on her own. But they won't elaborate on what they mean, and with that, Penny storms away in frustration, locking herself into her room. Later, May is working on the spider suit, trying to repair some of its weapons, while Penny doodles anime characters on the arms. Glancing over her shoulder, Penny suddenly sees Addie Brock. Walking through the hallways in a combat suit, slipping away from her aunt, Penny follows behind the new student. Suddenly peeking around the corner, Penny is shocked to discover a new combat mech, the Venom suit. Penny glares as she sees Uncle Ben talking to Addie, praising her connection with the Sim engine in the Venom suit. Her anger is interrupted, though, when the alarms begin to blare and running through the hallway, Penny quickly gets back into the spider suit, ready to deploy. Later, the spider deploys into the city to meet with the Morbius creature, a strange tentacled monster that is sucking energy out of the city. Penny jumps into action, whipping the creature's tentacles from the power sources that they are attached to. Her aunt and uncle giving her tactical advice over the comms. Citizens of the city run in fear as the combat armor and creature are locked into battle. But Penny begins to lose power as the creature's tentacles begin to wrap around the spider suit. Now completely drained, the suit is thrown away, and Penny is sitting angrily in the dark. She needs backup, and enter Addy in the Venom suit. The new mecha moves in fast, arm blades slicing through the Morbius tentacles. Uncle Ben is ordering her to stop. They want Morbius alive, but the suit, the Venom suit, it's not responding, and it's moving as if it's on its own. In the cockpit, Addy begins to hear voices. We can't go back. They'll kill us. It tells her. Wires begin to move throughout the cockpit, sliding and wrapping around Addy. We are now in control. Addy is no longer responding, and Ben and May can't shut down the suit from the control room, so they have no choice. Venom looks up as the chopper glides closer, and May descends from a ladder. Getting inside of the cockpit, May is shocked to see Addy. The suit is alive now, with its wires trapping her. Addie seems barely there anymore, her eyes a blank glaze. The voice that is issued from her throat isn't hers, and May tries to help, but the wires begin to engulf her as well. She screams for Ben over the radio, but then all is silent. Ben has managed to get power back to the spider suit. Springing back up, Penny locks into combat with the Venom suit, trying to save her aunt. The suit is more animal than machine now, with a long tongue of wires sliding out of its mouth. Venom is faster and more heavily armed, and Spider tries to stop it, but she can't. Venom pins her down, and the Spider is cracked and dented with each blow. Addie is gone. May is gone. We are Venom. The words come out of the suit, and Penny stares in horror, but May managed to fix the web shooters earlier that day, and they work now. Pinning Venom to the wall, Spider gets up, ripping the cockpit out of the Venom. But there's nothing there but wires. No pilot, no Aunt May. Later, 
Ben brings Penny a coffee in her room, and he tells her that what happened is not her fault. They can grieve together. Suddenly, the room is full of light as a portal opens up against one wall, and from it emerges Peter Porker. The multiverse needs all of the spider people that it can get, and Uncle Ben knows that the universe needs her. So Penny steps through the portal with the pig. On an unknown earth, in a bar called Stacy's, Ben Parker is parked at the counter. He stares down at the dead phone in his hands, and next to him a man is webbed to the counter. Struggling against his bonds, the bartender is a friendly sort, offering to charge the phone while he hands Ben a beer. The criminal tries to struggle some more and is rewarded with a blow from Ben's fist. Drinking his beer, Ben tells the bartender his story. You see, some time ago, Ben has fallen while coming out of the subway. His heart had given up on him, and he was lying down on the paint that spilled when he dropped it. His breath had come in gasps as the people of New York simply walked around him, completely ignoring someone in distress. And a little while later, Peter is watching a video of Spider-Man webbing up Jameson as he sits in the doctor's waiting room. In the office, Ben and May have just heard awful news. But should they tell Peter? May doesn't want to. Let's just let him be a kid for a little while, she suggests. Another time jump. Peter is outside the pharmacy while Ben learns that his health insurance won't cover his heart medication. Instead, he gets some pain medication and exits the pharmacy to discover that Peter isn't where he left him. Peter can't help himself and is posing as Spider-Man for people with their phones. This is unknown to Ben, though, who starts to walk down the street, not seeing the man shadowing him quickly or the gun that he pulls. The shots, they echo throughout the street, and the blood transfusion from Peter saved Ben's life. It was some time later before Ben discovered that it also gave him powers. That was when Ben knew that Peter was actually Spider-Man. He wasn't posing that day. Ben began to help Peter, stepping in to save him from the wrecker. The old man doesn't really know much about the superhero business, but he's tough. He can put up a fight. They argue. Is it right for them to stop the wrecker? And Ben learns that he was just defending his neighborhood from the developers who were trying to put people out of their homes. Peter counters. But what if he hurt someone doing it? The two begin to work together, stopping villains while Peter tries to decide on what their names should be. Apparently, Spider-Ben and Petey was too on the nose. The two worked well together, fighting crime, even taking part in the big spider war. And then it all went wrong. Itsy Bitsy Spider, the grave red. The dirt shook and trembled as Ben punched his way out of the grave, gasping for breath. He didn't have time to rest. He needed to save Petey. The rain fell as the lightning flashed over the house in the distance, and Ben Parker stalked his way forward, thoughts of stealth and secrecy gone. Inside, the sounds of Ben's fist impacting with the Craven the Hunter's face could be heard over the rain and the thunder. The questions didn't matter, and they only served as punctuation for each blow. Ben is finally interrupted as Petey, still groggy from the drugs, tells him that Craven fed him. He hugs Ben, scared. This is over. We're done, Ben told him. But Petey argued. Why does he get to decide that? Then Petey sees Craven, his face a bloody mess and shocked and horrified at what Uncle Ben did. Petey picks him up and he carries him out. But he tried to kill me, Ben whispers, not understanding his nephew. Ben has finished his story and his beer. The phone is finally charged with a few parting words. Ben exits the bar. You never know how long you have in this world. And Ben knows that better than anyone. Petey and May may be long gone. But he's still here. He stares down at the phone, a sad smile playing over his face as he sees pictures of him and Petey. And there you have it, the first three people to our spider get an epic. Now, this was gonna be one video, but it is too long and too awesome for one video. So make sure you subscribe because in a couple of days, we're gonna bring you part two, and that's gonna feature the superior octopus, the amazing Spider-Man from PlayStation 4, and an evil version of Norman Osborn. Go figure, right? Like, like there's ever a good version of Norman Osborn? Anyway, guys, make sure you subscribe, give this video a like, and stick around because we are going deep diving into that spider get in lore. We're gonna bring you the prequels, then we're gonna bring you the spectacular Spider-Man in which Peter Parker battled against Morlun, and then the epic finale, where Miles is our hero. Where Miles is our hero. I said that like, hero. It, it, I said it weird. It happens occasionally. When you talk all day, guys, that's what happens over here. Don't forget, you can find me over at twitch.tv slash monster, where you can find me mispronouncing and talking weird all day. <laughs> I'll see you next time right here.